I'm Melissa Idris, and you're watching The Future is Female, the show where we find the extraordinary in every woman. Now, for many Malaysians, the date May 9th will forever be associated with Pakatan Harapan's victory in the 14th general elections. But at least in the years to come, May 9th will also now be known as Report Card Day. So joining me on the show to discuss the performance of the Pakatan Harapan administration in the past year, especially when it comes to gender equality and women's empowerment and women's rights, we have on the show Ivy Josiah, who is a women's rights expert. She's also the former executive director of a Women's Aid Organization, which is an NGO, and currently the Secretary General of PROHAM, the Society for the Promotion of Human Rights. Now, next to her, we have Majida Hashem, who is the uh, Communications Manager at Sisters in Islam. And Yu Ren Cheng, who is the only uh, thorn among the roses today, I would say, advocacy <laughs> manager. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Ren Cheng is the advocacy manager at uh, Women's Aid Organization, WAO, as well. So. Uh, welcome to the show, guys. Uh, let's begin with, I guess, I want to get an assessment from all of you to review honestly and frankly Pakatan Harapan's uh, performance in the past year. Has Pakatan Harapan proven its seriousness in pushing for a gender responsive agenda? Ivy, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, having been, well, I'm a veteran activist, right? So I've worked <laughs> with the past administration for over 30 years. And when I compare it, even though there was excess in, with the past administration, for me, the interesting thing about access to the Ministry of Women, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Rural Development, and even the law minister, the Minister of Law, has been very different. Many, many people have approached the women's groups to talk about the gender policy and how they can work with women. So that I find very interesting. For instance, besides the Ministry of Women, we've had several meetings, uh, and they also wanted to have the background. They want to know what we have been promised by the old government, what have been all in our memorandums and demands. But for me, it's very interesting, for instance, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs called us in uh, to talk about the UPR process, the Universal Periodi Periodic Review. Oh. You know, and it was a, a, a really a good commitment because they had every department from every ministry at that round table looking at all the pledges. So I think there's a general openness, there's a more um, and a commitment and a real dialogue. Of course, it's 12 months. Right. I also can tell you that if I had about 23 meetings over violence against women in the past administration and nothing came out of that, mm -hmm. you know. So it's 12 months, meetings have started, commitments have been made. Okay, now we need to make sure they are implemented. And there has been some wins, right, Red? Yeah. Red, what about you? I mean, what were some of the wins that you thought? I, I think we can look at it uh, in two ways. So the first is to look at more short-term or uh, so current uh, gains, um, or, or changes at least. So uh, one, I think, is in the area of appointments, women representation in leadership positions. I think that's something that has been, I think, um, uh, highlighted again this week, especially with the... Uh, appointment of um, the, the Chief Justice of Malaysia, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, which is a huge milestone uh, um, uh, for women's representation mm -hmm. in Malaysia. Um, it, you know, we've not reached the 30% really in all, sphere, in all spheres, which was a commitment by the uh, Pakatan Harapan government, but we do see uh, improvements, changes. Uh, I, mean, I think Cabinet, which is the highest policy-making body in the country, uh, you know, we've gone from 9% um, to 18%. Right. Uh, from the past to, to present. So we do see some I increases there, I think. Uh, the other sort of more short-term, I think, change that we see is in, in terms of responses. Uh, responses by the government to current issues, or, or a case or you know, uh, um, something like that. Um, and I think we see a bit more responsive, uh, a bit more urgency. And you know, that's because it, it were, you know, we're democ democracy now, right? I mean, we can, uh, uh, we can say something. We can say something uh, you know, there's uh, the time is limited. Governments yes. can change. Uh, so, you know, to the, to the public out there, you know, keep on pushing, keep on, you know, highlighting these issues, raising in social media. Uh, do that because, you know, to a certain extent, it, it, it works. It, it works. And, and a case, I think, a case uh, uh, that highlights this is the Sungai Bulo sexual harassment case. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people say, you know, there's been a mixed response to various issues. Some have been maybe not so good. Some have been good. But this is a, a good example. They were, the government was very quick to respond to that, yeah. and I think that also had to do a lot with the, you know, 
the pressure that was put on by the public as well. Exactly. Yeah, there, there's a, been a very strong commitment towards uh, addressing sexual harassment per se. There's even an intentions that within this year, they're going to talk about the Sexual Harassment Act oh. uh, and, and, and bringing in things like the uh, Gender Equality Bill. And now the yes. law minister himself said that he wants to have anti-stalking uh, mm -hmm. laws as well. So all these coming out and them actually wanting to have this kind of discussions is actually very promising. But more important than saying that we want an a, a, a amendment to the stalking or to recognise stalking, there are already meetings going on. Yeah. You know, are, we are actually yeah. sitting and talking to okay. policy There's makers. There's a conversation and happening. happening. Yeah, and, and actual meetings to see, figure out a timeline and so on. Right. So I think that's, that's very important because we can make statements mm -hmm. all the time. You know, a manifesto can come out and make promises, but you know, the, is, the devil is in the details, right? Correct. So what next? Right. And the next is happening. Right. Yeah, Majida. So for you, um, the most significant improvement uh, has been through policy reform and, and laws. Um, the law is very promising because we see a lot of engagement happening. The government is now very interested with realities on the ground, and this is something that uh, reflects their genuine interest in, in in wanting to make policies which if, uh, have positive impacts on the ground. Mm -hmm. But one of the areas that uh, we see ha it has one of the biggest impact is where childcare and child protection is concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, there is initiatives now to make sure that every government building has a childcare centre. Uh, they've identified buildings that don't have and I, and, and acknowledging that there is a problem is a very positive step towards uh, solving the problem. The mm. uh, Ministry of Women also came up very positively and very strongly with a child sex offender registry. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and, and that really reflects the initiatives that, you know, they, that, that child protection is important. Uh, refugee children now get to go to school. Okay, so quite um, a wide yeah. range, right? So, this okay. is, so the, the, the steps towards uh, child protection, child care, actually has been very positive. Okay, so when you actually drill down into the details of the report yeah. card, there have been some significant wins. But uh, on what aspects do you think Pakatan Harapan has faltered? The red marks. The red <laughs> marks. Where have they failed? Where are the red markings in this report card, Ivy? Well, let's start with child marriage. Yeah. Because it kind of blew up, right, when, uh, when they first took over. Uh, and I think where child marriage is concerned, first of all, it is not only affecting a Muslim population, but it also affects a Hindu population, it affects indigenous people, so it affects all ethnicities. But of course there are varying levels, you know, uh, you know a nine-year-old Muslim girl could get married, a 15-year-old, uh, a 16-year-old um, Hindu girl can get married, and the indigenous groups are also very, very young uh, people can get married. And we all thought it was a low-hanging fruit, because yeah. who would want a child to get married, right? Mm -hmm. And yet there was resistance, right? right. And I think uh, there was initially a commitment, um, but however, there is now a pullback to say, well, uh, let us look into it. We're not going to be changing the law immediately, although there have been, what, five states have come out to say yes. They yeah, so there. five states have said that yes. Uh, when the Prime Minister came out with a directive last year, uh, after a meeting with the Chief Ministers, and he said that, okay, we're going to um, raise the age of marriage uh, right after that. So up to the progress until now, five states have said yes. Six states have said no. Mm -hmm. But this actually reflects how intricate on the ground um, this issue is and right. it expects uh, it, uh, it touches different aspects of people's lives it goes into areas that transcends whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim there are different areas mm -hmm. things like uh, access to education becomes mm -hmm. an issue mm -hmm. healthcare becomes an issue Quality. poverty becomes an issue so um, addressing this not only at a child marriage level but uh, fixing things like access to education uh, getting better health care addressing poverty per se mm -hmm. then becomes uh, something that is more systemic it ranges so you many other issues at, yeah. the bigger problem. picture but also there must be a timeline so yeah. you can say yes you know we need to talk to people mm -hmm. but I want to know what the program is mm -hmm. how you're going to go down to the ground so let's say in the next three years we're going to go down to the ground and explain to the community why there are choices why it's not good for a young girl to get married and you know give birth at the age of 13 why it's bad for her health and there are other opportunities. So there must be a three-year or two-year plan to go to the ground because in the two years, at the end of it, we are going to pass a law yes. banning marriages. Okay. So that kind of promise is what I... It's not that. It's the, missing. The, yeah. the, the target. It's not even a promise. It should, be, should be a target. Okay. You know, a KPI, so to speak. All right, we're going to come back and continue our conversation about Pakatan Harapan's commitment to improving women's rights after this, right here on The Future is Female. Hi, 
you're watching The Future is Female, uh, we're assessing Pakatan Harapan and their performance in the past one year in terms of promoting women's rights and gender equality. Uh, Renjung, where do you think Pakatan Harapan has faltered in the past year? I mean, we've spoken about the wins, but where have they not succeeded? I think um, uh, there are three areas we can mention. Maybe not as faltered, but sort of areas that we can sort of hope, hope, for hope, hope to, <laughs> yeah. or either improvement or hope to, to continue to go towards. Okay. So the first, I think, um, is to ensure that uh, all these, all positive laws and policies, fundamental rights and freedoms apply to every woman, mm -hmm. and not just um, uh, select groups of women. Right. I think we see, we've seen, uh, I think, the Women's March uh, that took place in Kuala Lumpur, uh, yes. uh, and the backlash to that, and the sort of the very negative harassment that's occurred um, uh, following that march has shown that um, even the fundamental freedom of uh, right to assembly, right to, free, uh, right to freedom of expression, that extends to everyone, regardless yes. of identity. So I think that is an area where uh, we need really need to work on and to really push the government to 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 show that look they're serious about women's rights, uh, gender equality for all, not just for you know certain groups of of, of women. That's one area I think. Uh, in terms of um, where we th I think we need to keep pushing. So one we have talked a lot about improvements. I think institutional change is something that's going to be it's going to outlast mm. any government. Institutional so, change. So yeah. uh, changes in laws and uh, appointments, responses. Those are short term. Things like uh, Bajidan and Ivy mentioned laws and policies. Mm. Yes. Those are things that that stick out through. Well, would have a higher likelihood of sticking out through any any government. Okay. So looking at following through on some of the good commitments that have already been made in terms of laws and policies, Gender Equality Act, Sexual Harassment Act. Uh, uh, anti-discrimination right. uh, laws and policy that's one area and then the other area I think we need to really look a bit more into is mainstreaming mm -hmm. so um, mainstreaming. I think Ivy's touched on this a little bit it's not that uh, gender is exactly it's not about uh, having policies that affect women only uh, like uh, gender equality and sexual harassment that tend to affect but all policies right. uh, you know any uh, uh, if, if you're having a development uh, uh, budget uh, where's the gender analysis so uh, if you're having a health uh, health care plan you know uh, how, how does it affect, how would it affect women and men differently? Okay. Uh, that's an area I think where uh, we need to look yeah. further into. Um, I, I want to come back to something that Ren Chong said earlier. You know, you talked a little bit about women, you know, that, that promise that Pakatan Harpa made in their election manifesto that uh, there would be 30% representation of women uh, in decision making uh, positions mm. beginning with cabinet. And you said, well, they, they went from 9% to 18%. Mm. There is an improvement but 18% is quite far from 30% still. So uh, do you see that as a win or as a setback? Well, it depends on, yeah. um, I think, yeah, yeah well, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an improvement. I think we have to really have to look deeper into uh, women's political representation. And if you look across the board in terms of candidates, that's where the real problem is. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yes. Only 12% of uh, MP candidates were uh, in the last election were women. Yes. Right. Out of those 12%, uh, the, uh, number of MPs that are women is 14%. So it, it's not true that women will be a losing uh, pros prospect. In fact, women, if anything, women win, win more than men. So if the, unless the political parties ensure that more women are, are stand for election, yes. then you can't have elected representatives who are women and therefore the talent pool for the Prime Minister to choose from for Cabinet will be limited. Absolutely. Right? And okay. that's why we need quotas. Mm. So even political parties must say, I must make sure at the next elections I'm going to have 30% of women running. Okay. And people are going to say, oh no, they're not qualified, they don't want to come forward. You will look for these women if there's a quota. Mm. There's a commitment. And it's over and over again, all over the world, it has shown. Quotas do work. Mm. Yeah. And please don't question us about, oh, are they actually qualified? Because we never question that when it comes to men, right? Yeah, you, I, I, uh, you get the quota, women will come forward. Well, they will come forward and they will volunteer themselves. And having run. a quota there, knowing that in, in four years' time now that you're going to, to have to fill this quota, what can you do now to right. train women on the ground exactly. or young women mm. to be interested in politics, to make them more political? savvy to have conversations within the community that everybody can participate especially women so that they can come up they can stand up and they can voice their views they can make preparations now and in fact I think a, a very important point to make when talking about quotas and women representation people think there's a trade-off as you mentioned right the uh, this trade-off between merit and and women's representation in fact mm -hmm. it's more like the opposite yeah. right. uh, studies have shown that you know one uh, diversity mm -hmm. in leadership improves overall decision making mm -hmm. but also um, a lot of studies have shown that underrepresentation of women is not due to uh, lack of merit but it's due to biases and when these biases mm -hmm. are removed 
uh, more qualified people are hired and those more qualified people um, uh, are women. Mm. Yes. So there isn't a trade-off between merit and, and so, women's representation. So what we've seen actually is that while there hasn't been quite as many women in cabinet as we would like, uh, what we have seen is there have been changes at uh, GLCs and GLICs, I'll say agent, government agencies, um, and that's been quite rapid compared to this masculine model of politics uh, that we've seen. Why do you think that is and is that encouraging? To have it more in the corporate sector, I mean we've had uh, a whole slew of appointments in the corporate, corporate sector, sector yeah. who are women in uh, decision making positions or leading um, the organizations compared to politics and I'm wondering why there's been it a makes bit money of sense because the corporate sector knows that it makes business sense yeah. to have women at the helm yeah, because they're going to expand your business mm. unfortunately in the but in the public sector in government you do have quite a number of women in decision making yes. positions it's a political parties that are really very reluctant you know because I think it's to do with patriarchy and power and all of that kind yeah. of uh, issues mm. that come in right mm. but the but the corporate yeah. center is all about business and they realize that the, the, the businesses are better run less corruption too but also that um, it used to be in the previous administration or even where GLCs and corporates are concerned it was about who you know and instead yes. of what you know right. but in this new uh, new administration especially at the corporate center it is beginning to recognize it's what you know not who you know yeah. it's merit starting based. it's yes. complete merit based and it, it is being shown that women are capable and they are qualified and they want to fill these positions and this is starting to be reflected in at the political sense itself it's and it has to move move this direction in the future. It's about what you know, not about who you know. Uh, Melissa, I also want to talk about uh, something that's very dismaying for me. You know, as a human rights defender of, for over 30 years, um, Ren Chung talked about how the Women's March, mm. you know, where one group, the LGBTIQ community, was then bashed and hated. Mm. Uh, more, more recently, you know, uh, a human rights defender who went to Geneva to talk about LGBTIQ yes. rights uh, was called in by the police. And I think this kind of intimidation and the kind of hate language against a particular community, mm. and it happens even with, you know, refugees and migrants. You know, one community becomes the other, right. and becomes feared and hated and they become, you know, a punching bag. A punching bag, and yeah. that, I think, on record, the women's groups are saying that we do not want this anymore. Mm -hmm. We are We're going to fight this. We're going to come back and, and discuss that further, Ivy. The responses of Pakatan Harapan, two specific issues that have flared out over the past year, particularly the responses to the Women's March the organization. UN, uh, Correct. Mm -hmm. So let's come back and discuss that right here on The Future's Female. Stay with us. Watching the future as female, we're assessing Pakatan Harapan's report card on women's rights for the past one year that they've been in Putrajaya. Now, I want to talk a little bit about their responses when it comes to issues that have flared up in the past uh, one year. We've talked a little bit about child marriage, which was one issue that they have had to handle. The responses to the Women's March, especially in light of the Me Too movement that happened uh, this year, the Women's March. Now, talk to me about the messaging coming out of the Pakatan Harapan administration because, in a sense, the way they've responded to this is, where, is how they're, what they're putting out, the messaging that they're putting out. Has the messaging been consistent throughout the 12 months and throughout the entire Pakatan Harapan administration? Majida, what do you think? Um, where messaging is concerned, I think there is, there is a yes and a no. Mm. Uh, where yes is concerned, they have been very consistent on uh, the women's empowerment uh, agenda. They, want, they have the intentions uh, to address different issues of women. So, say for example, when we launched uh, our Telenisa statistics, there was a real interest in the ministry about the kind of data that we have gathered and the statistics of stories of women on the ground. Mm. Um, but at the same time, where, where, where messaging is is concerned, the example when, that you gave, like the, where, where Women's March is concerned, right. um, we see them addressing what has been sensationalized in the media, which is things like LGBT. Um, 
what was completely disregarded in the response to the Women's March is the actual demands of the Women's March itself. Mm -hmm. Things like asking for um, raise in minimum wage, right. uh, things like Which asking for... Fulfilled, right? we, yeah. yeah, I mean... Well, um, we're not happy with the quantum, the quantum but yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, uh, when, when you have issues like minimum wage, of course it affects everyone, but how it affects women uh, is so much greater than... Uh, and, and that has to be acknowledged. Right. Things like uh, Women's March asking for to end uh, gender-based violence. The irony of the whole situation is that we're asking to end our gender-based violence. When you pick on LGBTs of the march itself, it is perpetuating gender-based violence. So there is a, a very disconnect mm -hmm. in how they've responded yeah. to that. But we also need to be aware, and we are also learning as civil society, that when they did it, I wouldn't call a U a, 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 a U-turn, <laughs> but a step back when it came to the Rome Statute or yeah. the or the UN uh, I said uh, on uh, racial discrimination, and then of course everything is wonderful after hindsight. So I asked myself, didn't they do a risk analysis to say, Before okay, I'm going to do this, I come out with a UN treaty, we're going to sign on to it, the Rome Statute. What will be the risk analysis? Because right. we have an opposition that's basically branding everything is against race, religion, and royalty. Uh -huh. We know this is a strategy, and that spooks the administration. Everybody yeah. gets spooks. They shudder. They they fumble and they fall. Mm. So for me, it would be. Now that we know that this is the strategy, we need to figure out, work together on how we prepare the ground, number mm, one, yeah. have the risk analysis, come up with the answers. And I think with the Rome Statute, they are doing an aggressive, they're going around to the ground to explain to people this is not going to affect race, right. religion, and royalty. Yeah, and that, but that it's like lack the, of but explaining to the, the ground Yeah, has been but the kind of like the horses are very out of the, uh, you know, <laughs> out of the stable right yes. now. But you know what? It's 12 months. Okay. Civil society is also learning that we need to prepare the ground, do a risk analysis, and really go out to people to make them understand that this is not a risk, this mm -hmm. is not a threat. That we, you know, when a, a Muslim uh, wins, a Hindu wins. When a Kadazan wins, you know, an Indian wins, you know, a Chinese wins. We need to really look about that we're doing this, we're sharing the nation. Okay, right. Ren, I mean, you as advocacy manager at WAO, I mean, you, you work closely with the government, so ministries, and also with uh, the ground, right? So talk to me a little bit about the Pakatan Harapan government coming from an opposition mindset. My thinking is that they will be friendly parties to activists and civil society because they, they've, you know, many of them themselves have been activists yeah. on the other side as well. So has that been your experience? Yeah, I think um, uh, there's a lot of issues that we can agree on with the government, such as um, uh, addressing violence against women, uh, stalking, domestic violence, sexual assault, things like that. So these are areas where there's common interests. And on these areas, uh, we found that yeah, I mean, the government it wants to change. They want to improve. And, uh, you know, as an NGO, um, we work with government to try and bring about these, these changes. Uh, so, so, Pakatan Harapan before winning, or Pakatan Harapan we leaders before yeah. winning Putrajaya uh, were, were supportive. And even now in Putrajaya, are, they, are you seeing the, the same? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would say so. I mean, I, I wouldn't completely say the previous government was, you know, not uh, in, interested in engaging. The, the, uh, we, we did have they a did good engage. working relationship with uh, the previous administration as well. I mean, there were certainly some good leaders there. Um, but, you know, in the current administration, yeah, I think we do see a bit more openness, a bit more openness. Um, you know, I think we can uh, bring that down to, uh, you know, one, uh, individuals in, in power are very, uh, you know, some of them are very interested in policy, very interested in, in change. Uh, and I think more importantly, uh, um, this accountability. Right. The government's accountable to people. People can vote in, vote out government. Right. And so um, uh, we need to use, uh, w w being, being aware of that, we need to really uh, drive change in, in the time frame that we have. Do you think the honeymoon period is over for Pakatan Harapan? I mean, one year in. I mean, it's been a tough I one I don't year. think they had a honeymoon they at all in the last 12 they months. They <laughs> I mean, they have really been attacked and trolled so and, and held accountable. But that's democracy for you, right? Yeah, well, democracy is messy. Uh, mm. And you're right. I mean, having had people who were on our side and every time we wanted to have a get statistics, I think we'll go to the MP who is now a minister. Yeah. So they do know the issues. But now it's about how they're going to use that power because it's only been 12 months, yeah. right? Like I said, we had access in the, with the former government. We had meetings, we had commitments. We are now seeing that they're doing the same thing. And we are also seeing that they're taking steps to implement, but we need to keep them at it to make sure they continue and be on track mm -hmm. to implement. We cannot just, we cannot rest. Okay, so 
be constantly vigilant. So that's Absolutely. that's, that's yes. your next, that's your Absolutely. mandate for the next yes, uh, few right. years. Yes. Majida and Ren, if I give you a couple minutes to sum up, Majida. I think um, when they first got into power, they really immediately had to act, like Avi was mentioning. So there were things that they did um, which were which were very uh, ad hoc, more, more spontaneous. Mm -hmm. But now, like you mentioned, um, if there was a honeymoon, it's now completely <laughs> over. And it's like, you know, six, uh, 12 months in. Um, I think a lot of the things they want to go moving forward really needs a good strategy that's planned out and there's a roadmap towards where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this must include engagement with CSOs, engagements on the ground, making sure everybody is on board. Mm -hmm. Um, to, and, and, and that's how you get things working and we're at the policy level, at the change that you want to make. This really needs to be very clear. Uh, those that don't have, that did not have a roadmap, we have seen how they have been got, how they've fallen, things like that. Very but, yeah. quickly, Ren, if I could get you as well. Yeah, I think three things again. Well, one is follow through on those positive commitments yes. that are in the works, mm, Gender right. Equality Act, Anti-Stalking Legislation, Sexual Harassment Act, even changes to the Employment Act which affect women. So these are positive things in the pipeline. So we just need to follow through on those. Mm -hmm. Two, uh, mainstream. So don't just limit women's issues to Ministry of, to, to Ministry of Women and sort of women's, yeah, yeah, keep it across the board. And third, uh, don't leave anyone out. You know, uh, bring uh, everyone together. Yeah. No woman left behind. Yes. yes. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, you guys, for being on the show today. That's all the time we have. A big thank you to all my guests for being on the show today. You've been watching The Future is Female. I'm Melissa Idris, and I'll see you same time next week. Thank you.